to look at how biblical this is. So go to 1 Timothy. You're in Titus. Back up to 1 Timothy. And I want to show you, I want to show you how biblical love that can be felt truly is in the scriptures. Because Paul, in 1 Timothy, starting in chapter 1, in verse 2, cultivated this type of love that can be felt with a needy young man named Timothy. In 1 Timothy 1-2, we meet the mighty pastor of the church at Ephesus, but this mighty pastor was also a young man who had many physical and emotional needs. And Paul nurtured this, what he called my son, his child, in the faith, with a love that Timothy could see and feel. That means Paul loved his son Timothy, and Timothy knew it. How do you know it? By the way Paul acted toward him, by the way Paul talked to him, and by the way Paul talked about him to others. All of those are dimensions of how we show our love. Paul loved his son. His love was expressed through the powerful encouragement of affirmation. And in 1 Timothy 1, Paul explained to Timothy, starting in the second verse, what he thought of him. Now, just that he said all this, by the way, you're reading it. That means it was public. Paul didn't hide this. He didn't make Timothy scratch his head and wonder, what do wonder Paul really thinks about me? He wrote it down. He had it read to Timothy. This letter would have been read out loud. It's amazing to think about. Well, first, Paul, in verse 2, told Timothy publicly that he was a gift from God to his life. Timothy was a true son. He said to Timothy, a true son in the faith. He said, you're a gift from God. In God's great plan, in in the great work of salvation, you're a true son. Now, what he could have said is, Timothy, you're a believer. And just, you know, kind of gave the cold facts of salvation. But he said, more than a believer, Timothy, you're a true son to me. Remember, Paul didn't have children. Remember, Paul didn't have, well, he had a family because his nephew helped him when he was in jail in Jerusalem. We read that in Acts. But Paul didn't have a normal family, a wife and children. And so he said, you're my true son. You're the one that that ministers to me. You are a blessing in my life, Timothy. But he didn't stop there. Look at chapter 4. And and the theology of Paul's nurturing ministry is so big, I'm just jumping over. It's kind of like we're going from mountaintop to mountaintop. But Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.12, that his life was deeply useful to God as an example to the flock. Can you imagine how Timothy felt when Paul said, your life, look at verse 12. He says, let no one despise your youth, Timothy. You're a young guy and you've got all these problems, but don't let them look down on you because you are an example to the believers in, in word and what you say and what you do in your love. And, and he just goes through this list. Can you imagine how Timothy felt? Now, Paul could have thought that all day long, but it didn't really impact Timothy till Paul, what? Said it to him. He says, wow, your life is deeply useful to God. Look at verse 14. Paul told him that there was a unique and divine calling on his life because he had a gift. And he wasn't blowing smoke. He says, every child of God, every one of us have a a unique fingerprint, a, a spiritual We're like spiritual snowflakes. No two of us are the same. God blends together His gifts and His calling to make us this uniquely gifted tool in His hands to accomplish His purposes, Acts 13.22, in our generation. So Paul told him in in verse 14 of chapter 4 that he was unique. He had a divine calling in his life. And, And Paul says, don't neglect the gift that's in you. You've got it. It was given to you by the prophetic laying on of hands of the elders. And, and he says later in 2 Timothy 1.6 that he needed to stir that gift up. Because, see, Timothy was one of these perpetual, discouraged, you know, cried and, and weak. And, you know, it, it's just so interesting how, how Paul encouraged him. Keep going to uh, chapter 5, verse 23. Paul was also, fourthly, very careful to never belittle Timothy for his weaknesses. Look what it says in verse 23. He says, hey, Timothy, don't just drink bottled water anymore. Put a little medicine in it for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. Do you know what Paul didn't say? Buck up, man. Suck it in. Be tough. Be like me. Go get beat up in the jail. No, no. He says, hey, Timothy, you're a little, a little weaker. Put a little medicine in your water. You're sick a lot. 
Paul didn't say go out and run the arena and let the lions chase you. You know, he didn't he didn't try and put him in impossible situations. He had frequent infirmities and Paul never belittled Timothy for his weaknesses. Think about that. Think about how sarcastic, how easy it is to point out people in in this context, children's weaknesses. Paul didn't do that. He never belittled Timothy for his weaknesses. In fact, 2 Timothy 1, 4 says that he has frequent tears. And Paul said, I'm greatly desiring to see you. Be mindful of your tears that I might be filled with joy. He says, I love you the way you are. And I can't wait to see you just like you are. I don't, I'm not trying to make you into something you're not. You're not like me. I want you to be who you are, who God made you to be. Another thing Paul said to him, look at chapter 6, verse 20 of 1 Timothy. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 6.20 that he had a treasure entrusted to him. He says, guard what was committed to your trust. Avoid profane and idle babblings and contradictions falsely called knowledge. He says, don't stop. Hold on tight to what God gave you. You You're a treasure. You've got the gospel. You're like a soldier guarding that. Make sure you fulfill your calling. You're gifted. If you keep going to 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul also reminded Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.15 that he had an incredible spiritual heritage. He says, remember, you've known this since you were a child. Verse 15 says, and that from childhood you've known the Holy Scriptures. He was encouraging him about his upbringing. He says, you have a great rich heritage. You have a faith that your grandparent, your grandmother had, Lois and your mother Eunice, and, and now you've got it. And, and he just reminded him of that, that heritage spiritually he had. And then I love how Paul ends. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. He said this. He says to Timothy, you know what? God's really going to use you. Now, think about that. Think about how it must have encouraged Timothy that as Paul was waning and, and was actually in death row, in prison, awaiting execution, Paul says, Timothy, you know, my time's trying to close, but your time's just beginning. God's going to really use you. And this is what he says in 2 Timothy 4, 8. Finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. But not just to me, but to all that love disappearing. Timothy, God's going to reward you. So Paul demonstrates how to love a child in the faith in a manner that love can be felt. Paul shows how to love someone with love of affirmation. He affirmed Timothy. He used tender and encouraging words to help Timothy. He exhorted him in his struggles. Do you know what that tells me? And by the way, this is just one small snapshot. You can see this sprinkled all the way through the way Paul dealt with those that he was nurturing. You know what it tells me? Titus 2.4 says that we need to practice ways. Last week, to love our husbands in a way they can feel. This week, to love our children in ways that they can feel. Make sure your loved ones feel your love. To help them receive and be touched by your love, there are several key ingredients. And Paul gives us all of them. Let me, I'm just going to read one, and next week we're going to talk. Next week's going to be the practical session. You know, How to practically love your husband. How to practically love your children. Let me just read these to you, okay? Godly moms who partner with God in raising their children love their children in a way that can be felt when they prepare special words for them. Now think about Paul. Paul is old. He's been beaten so many times. He really has arthritis and every other pain. And he hunches over a writing table and he thoughtfully, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, pens personal, special words to affirm and encourage this child in the faith. Paul, and like Paul, we should use tender and encouraging words to help our children Like Paul, we should never belittle our children for their weaknesses and tears. We should always remember that hugs are never enough. 
We need to tell our children how we feel about them. And those who are left to fill in the blanks often will feel worthless and insecure. At best, only confusion can come from silence. Far too many of us are really not that encouraging. It's not that we have a critical spirit. It's just that we don't say anything. And our loved ones are not mind readers. We can do better than just expecting them to know that we're in their corner or loving and admiring them silently. They need to hear it. And mothers who are in partnership with God in raising their children make an effort to catch those children doing something good, something right, something thoughtful, something considerate, something that's been well done, and they point it out and highlight it. Kind of like you see your child pick up some trash and put it in the trash can, you go, oh, wow, that is so good. Out of the 50 million pieces of trash on the floor, you picked one up and put it in the trash. Good job. They'll go, wow. They'll pick another one up just to see if you'll say something. And those words are words of encouragement. You know, just to close, I'll tell you, Yesterday I spoke at the commencement that I spoke at, and I was telling them commencement means the beginning, but I said also commencement marks the end of something. I said, for all of you parents sitting out here, this is kind of like the formal ending to your close-up parenting of these children. Now, you go through life, you're the parent, they're your child. When they come to Christ, you're your brother and sister. But I told them that the biggest responsibility that God says that you are to have with your children is that you become best friends with them. As you'll see in the rest of these qualities, that that if you become this kind of loving friend, you'll know how to pray for them because they share their life with you. You'll know how to encourage them because they'll share their weaknesses with you. You know how to affirm them because they will share with you their, their deepest inmost secrets and goals. But I was watching the graduation after I got in speaking. I went down and sat with my family and I looked up on the stage and they were coming and it was a, a the largest homeschool group in, in Tulsa, and, and there are hundreds of homeschooling families. And so all these parents were coming and presenting their diplomas. And do you know what? They would present the, right in the center stage, and everybody was watching. They present the diploma, and then they were supposed to somehow show their affection to their child. And you know what you could tell? The parents would never practice closeness and warmth and love with their children. Because they hand them that diploma and they kind of went, you know, it's like hugging a cactus. They didn't know quite how to do it. You know, it was like, uh, you know, you weren't sure what they were doing. If they were just hitting with their pads like in football or what. Because they had never cultivated a close, loving, nurturing, affectionate. Both sides you could see there was a little something that this is foreign to me. Remember, God will never judge you on how your children turn out. But He will look you in the eye and say, Did you raise them the way I told you to? Loving them in a way they could feel? So that you could be lifelong best friends, sharing their burdens, encouraging them, so that like Paul, at the end of your life, you can say, You know what? I'm not going to be here much longer, but you're going to do great things for God. That's love that can be felt. 